37. Okay. So we got the limit. Okay. The limit as x approaches zero of make sure I got the, the square root of three plus arc tangent of one over x. Is that right? Is that right? Is that what it said? Yes, that's what it says. This is a good one to think about. This is probably more difficult than I would expect to see on the AP test, but it's a good one to think about. Um, so if we try to plug in zero to that, um, we end up with three plus the inverse tangent of infinity. True? Because one over zero, or one over something very close to zero, one over a very small number is infinite. Um, and you might right off the bat be like, oh, well, hmm, inverse tangent of infinity, that doesn't make a lot of sense and just say it doesn't exist. That's a problem because you can take the inverse tangent of infinity. We think about the tangent function. That was so horribly not to the origin like it was supposed to be. That's better. There's your tangent function. We say, when does tangent hit infinity. Well, tangent goes up to infinity at this vertical axis point at x equals pi over 2. So the inverse tangent of infinity is actually pi over 2. So we we do that and we say, oh, it's square root of 3 plus pi over 2. Wonderful. And that's an answer choice. And we feel really good about ourselves when we put down the answer. And then we never know that we got it wrong because they don't tell you what you missed on the AP test, but you'd be wrong. Right? Uh, and the reason is we think about infinity and plugging in a zero here well from the right hand side let's just talk about one over x from the right that is equal to a positive infinity isn't it but from the left hand side that is equal to a negative infinity so effectively what i'm looking at here then is from the right i'm looking at the square root of three plus inverse tangent of infinity. And from the left, I'm looking at the square root of three plus inverse tangent of negative infinity. And negative infinity, the inverse tangent of that, is negative pi over two. So from the right hand side, we get three square root of three plus pi over two. But from the left hand side, we get the square root of three minus pi over two. And since the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, we would say that the limit, the two sided limit, can't possibly exist. Does that make sense to everybody? And then I'm not sure who asked for that, but does that make sense? Yes. Wonderful. That's great. Anytime you see this one over x term in there, and you have a limit as x approaches zero, um, be careful with that and, and look at it from the left and from the right because as we approach one over we approach zero, one over x from one side is infinity, the other side is negative infinity. And if an infinity and a negative infinity give you different values, that's probably going to give you different limits. Probably. Cool. All right. So what what um, I'm I'm looking at the end here. You're talking about like those problems at the end that you want to talk about. Okay. Um, you don't have the packet in front of you, I guess. Did you do so? You did stuff at the beginning, or you did stuff towards the end? Or? Okay. Um, trying to find one. I don't know. Do you want to just like one second, Zoom? Then we will have more questions. You can type them in the chat and I get to them in a second.
Function that they're calling the greatest integer function, y equals the greatest integer less than or equal to f. Um, this is a function that I think we talked a little bit about maybe in, in quarter two, but we may have only just like, I may have just like been like, yeah, and this is a function, but you should have seen it in the past. The greatest integer function looks like this, that function. Does that look familiar to everybody? Y'all seen this ever in another class sometime? What? Yeah, I think I, real quickly, I think I might have, yeah. Um, so 28 is asking us, and, and if they do talk about the greatest integer function, which is a, it's a small possibility, because I've seen a couple of questions over the, you know, over the past 20 years, I've seen a couple of questions about the greatest integer function. The greatest integer function says, um, Take your x value and find the largest integer that is less than or equal to that number. So, like if we're looking at a value of zero, the largest integer less than or equal to zero is zero. At point one, the largest integer less than or equal to point one is zero. And the next integer below that is zero. So, all the way until I get to like point nine, 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 the largest integer that is less than or equal to that is zero. When I hit one, the largest integer less than or equal to one is then becomes one. So that's how we get these steps. Does that, does that make sense about the function itself? Okay. Um, so then I think 28 was asking about the limit. Yeah, the limit as x approaches a half. Perfect. Um, so as x approaches a half, uh, the greatest integer function, because it has all these discontinuities, we want to be careful with it. Um, but from the left-hand side, as we approach a half, and from the right-hand side, as we approach x equals a half, we're still going to be going towards the value of zero, right? Because there is, I mean, there is a point there at zero, and on the interval surrounding x equals a half, the function is continuous there, and so therefore that limit should be zero. Does that make sense? Then the second one it asked was add a specific integer to it. It asks about the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function. And so then if we look at it at negative 2, let's see, there's negative 1, there's negative 2. From the left hand side, the value that we are at is negative 3. But from the right hand side, the value that we are at is negative 2. And so on the right hand side, on the left, Negative three from right, negative two. And since the left and the right limits aren't the same, now it should be. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. And there's there's only a small chance that you'll see the greatest integer function on the AP test. Um, what's more likely? Than, than to like specifically talk about the greatest integer function is that they might give you a graph that just looks like this or something that looks similar to this and, and ask you about the limits. And um, just know that it's a, yeah, make sure you look from the left and the right for whatever. Other questions from, did you want to look through there again? And or was that the, that was the one? Other questions from the limits multiple choice from anybody? So it sounds like we're going to have to do another review of the limits multiple choice when people have actually done it. People at home, how many of you did all the limits questions? Just say, just say yes, if you did. Unmute yourself and say yes. Yes. Yes, but it was like months ago, so I forgot everything. Well, then you should have lots of questions if you forgot everything. I forgot if I had questions. 
Yesterday would have been a good time to look there and see if you did. Oh, well. See, uh, so two people said, yes, they've done the model. That's not that many. Two out of 20 plus eight. That's one fourteen. That's not so good. That's just a little more than 7%. That's a horrible half. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll move away from the limits multiple choice. And Am I going to get the same response if I ask about the derivative multiple choice? I have two questions. All right. Good. Uh, well, we'll do any questions from the derivative multiple choice, and then if this doesn't take a lot of time, we'll do questions from the homework, and then after that, we'll just do new material because I don't know. I, I literally spent all of period four, period four. I spent all of period four going through multiple choice questions. They they, they did this. Okay, what are your questions for the derivative of multiple choice? 37 and 87. Okay. 37, that's the uh, the limit one, limit as h approaches zero, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. So it's a 37 from the derivative of multiple choice. With the limit as h approaches zero of natural log of d e plus h minus one. All over H. Okay. So there are two ways to look at this one. First off, um, the first thing you probably did is you probably said, okay, it's a limit, plug in zero. True? So if you plug in zero, you got natural log of E minus one over zero, which you decided natural log of E is one, I hope, and said one minus one is zero, and then zero over zero. Cool. All right. That sucks. So um, it's indeterminate. So once you realize that it's indeterminate, there are two ways to go about it, really. One is L'Hopital's rule. Okay. So we'll do that, and then we're going to look at another way to do it, which is really the reason why they have this question on there. But it should be pretty straightforward, I hope, with L'Hopital's rule. And I'm going to say this again. Remember, if you are using L'Hopital's rule on a free response question, make sure you write out using L'Hopital's rule. Don't just write LH like I'm lazy and do. Actually, write out using L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so the derivative of natural log of e plus h. So that's natural log of u. So it should be 1 over u. Right here. And 1 over u times the derivative of u. So times the derivative of e plus h. Well, the derivative of e, e is a constant, right? So the derivative of any constant is always 0, right? The derivative of a constant is 0. And then the derivative of h. That's our variable. Right, so the derivative of base is 1. So I'm multiplying by 1. So just leave it as it is. Then derivative of minus 1, 0. And derivative of h, 1. So I just have 1 over e plus h. And e goes, or sorry, h goes towards 0. That should be 1 over e. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that'll, that'll make it tougher to do this thing. Now, the other thing that they, the reason they put this problem on there is not because they want you to use L'Hopital's rule. Actually, the reason they put this one on there is because they want you to realize that this limit is the limit definition of the derivative. This is the limit of h approaches zero of f of some x plus h minus f of x over h. Okay, it doesn't quite look like it, but we're going to say that f of x is equal to ln x. And, uh, x is equal to e. So they want you to sort of piece it together that that's what they're looking, that's what you're looking at here. Um, because if you, if you thought of it that way, right, this would then become the, the limit definition of the derivative would be the limit of h approaches zero of the function at x plus h, right? Well, x plus h minus the function at x all over h. And so you see that's exactly what we have. We have natural log of e plus h minus 1 over h. And so they would say, oh, so they would want you to think, oh, okay, this then is, this limit is the same as the derivative of ln x at e. And what's the derivative of ln x? It is 1 over x evaluated at e is 1 over e. We get the same. 
So that's what they're thinking that you will do. Um, but Locatel's rule is perfectly fine. Does that make sense to you people at home? Yes. Wonderful. The people here? Yes. Nope. So the multiple choice, you do not need to. Uh, you're talking about on the AP test. Yeah. No. Do you bubble in the thing and say run it through a machine? It's not like a Scantron, Scantron, but it's, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, you think of the SAT, I assume. Yeah. It's just like a big bubble sheet. Yeah. 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 I mean, they give you like a, it's like a little booklet and then like a different thing. It's like, Within the booklet, there's multiple choice, and then there's three response based on all that. There's multiple booklets that they give you when you're taking it. It's fun and exciting. Um, I, honestly, like, I couldn't tell you exactly what it looks like because the last time I have physically seen a copy of the AP test is when I took the AP test when I was in high school because I, I'm not allowed in the room. So like I can't. It may look a little different. I mean, I, I know what the format is and all that, but like I haven't. Yeah, I'm not since I have a math credential. I am not allowed in the room that anybody is taking a math AP test. I'm not even allowed in, like if they're taking AP stats or something. So. Same with like, I mean, I have a history credential and an English credential. So like, if they're taking the AP European history test, I cannot in the library. I cannot go in the library or else like all of the scores are nullified. I try not to do that. All right, um, 87. Yes, 87 is the other one you asked for. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, we got f of x is equal to x cubed minus 3x squared plus 8x plus 5. And G is F inverse, and we want to know G prime of five. All right, so <clears throat> this requires the use of the inverse rule. Um, we talked about the inverse rule back during quarter two. We didn't really review it, because I knew we'd do it when we did some of these multiple choice questions. The inverse rule says that if you have two functions that are inverses, and F contains the point A, B, and G then must contain what point? If F contains A, B, and F and G are inverses, G contains B, A. B, A. Zoom participation. Yeah. Um, then F prime of A is equal to 1 over G prime of B. So if they're inverses, then this statement must be true. And, and so that's the statement that we're going to use for this. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to figure out, you know, we want g prime of 5, which tells us that g has a point 5 something, which means that f has a point something 5. And so what we need to find out is what is this x value when f of x equals 5? Because g prime of 5 ought to be 1 over f prime of that value. So when does f equal 5? Well, get this equal to 5. Okay. And when we do that, we can subtract 5 from both sides. And then it's equal to 0. And so we've got x cubed minus 3x squared plus 8x equals 0. Or x times x squared minus 3x plus 8 equals 0. And so we're Hopefully now, since this is a cubic, it's possible that it's got three different solutions. Luckily, we get x equals zero for one of them, and the other two, um, if you try to solve x squared minus three x plus eight, you'll find that that comes out to be two imaginary solutions. But you can test that and figure it out really quickly and easily by doing the discriminant. Remember what the discriminant is? From like way back when we took algebra one. B squared minus 4ac, right? If b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, it has no real solution. And in this case, b is 3, or negative 3, so b squared is 9. 
minus 4 times 1 times 8. 9 minus 32 is negative, right? So this is the thing inside the square root of your quadratic formula. So the step value where it's square root of negative, so no resolution. So the only possible value of x is 0, which is good, because if there are other values of x, it would be impossible for us to know which one to put in here. There's only one, so we put in there, which tells us that g prime of 5 is equal to 1 over f prime of 0. So then we got to figure out what is f prime of 0. f prime is 3x squared plus, missed the middle term, 3x squared minus 6x plus 8. f prime of 0 is 8. So this ought to be 1 over 8. Does that make sense? And there's, uh, I, would, I would say that. Is almost guaranteed that somewhere in usually the non calculator multiple choice, and strangely enough, it is more often than not like the last question in the non calculator multiple choice, or like in the last couple, something with the inverse rule. And for some reason, students always struggle with the inverse rule. It's one of the most missed questions almost every year. You'll find that if you go back through that derivative multiple choice, there's a few more that use this inverse rule too. That was a weird sound that all made. I don't know what that was about. No. Does that make sense at home too? Yep. Yeah. Good. All right. Other questions from the derivative multiple choice? Um, can you do 88? Like the 88. one. And what? Uh, just the one under 87. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I threw my book over here and now it's not the same thing. Let's see. 88. All right. 88. We've got. Is limit as x approaches 0 of g of x minus g of 0 over x equals 1. And then it says it follows necessarily the, okay, that's the right here. I'll hold it quick. So, quick a is g. Well, first off, let's talk about what this is before we look at our answer short. Um, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of g of x minus 0 of 0 over, uh, over x. This is, again, they want you to recognize that this is a different form of the limit definition of the derivative. So way back when, I think I very briefly mentioned that right, the definition of the derivative is this. Right? We did, I mean, I didn't briefly mention this. We did this a lot. And I think I very briefly mentioned that this is the same as the limit as x approaches a. Uh, f of x minus f of a over x minus x. So those are both the limit definition of the derivative. And so what we're looking at here is the limit as x approaches 0, so a is 0, g of x minus g of a, 0, over x minus a, 0. So that's what we're looking at here. So this is saying that the derivative of d at 0 equals 1. Okay? That's what this is saying. Does that make sense to ever ask that? Yeah. Okay. So now, now we'll look at our answer choices. Um, oh, and our answer choice should be d, g prime of 0 equals 1. Again, yes, wonderful. Is that good with everybody here? There you, you yeah, okay. You were like, mm. okay, all right. So, no, both of those forms are the limit definition. Of the Anybody else? Any other derivatives? Multiple choice questions. 
Can you go over 74 and 75? 74 and 75, yeah, definitely. 74. 74 gives us a really fun table of value. This is the good one for us to talk about. Gives us 1.92, 1.93. 1.9, 1 1.9, 1 8. Oh, no. That's the the right? That's and 2. Uh, gives us 6, 5, 4.4, 4.1, and it says estimate x prime of two. All right. So this is something that is commonly asked actually in the free response as like the first part of a free response question, um, where they give you a chart of a bunch of values and then ask you to approximate the derivative of some value that's in the chart. Uh, now, normally, that's only worth like one or two out of the nine points of that one free response question, but it should be easy points to get once you know how to do it. Yeah. So the derivative, they're asking you to estimate the derivative, which means you're not looking for an exact value. And the best way to approximate a derivative on a small scale or really based on charts that you're given is to find the average rate of change of the function at this value. So uh, most of the time, they will ask you for something like, if they gave you this chart, I would have expected them to ask you for the average rate of change at 1.94, because that's directly between 1.93 and 1.95. And then you would just find the slope between those two points. But if they ask you at an endpoint, like they did, the best you can do is find the slope between these two points. So we're just going to find the slope between uh, 1.98 and 2. We'll do 4 minus 4.1 over 2 minus 1.98, negative 0.1 over 0 0.02, it's got to be what, negative 5? You get that decimal over twice, you get negative 10 over 2, and negative 5. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we don't need to try and like find the point afterwards and do anything with that. We just okay. Use those two. Okay. If they give you a chart, don't try to come up with some other point on that chart. Always use what's given. Good. Good. Go here. Good. All right. And then you said seventy-five also. Yes, please. Okay. So they want us to find F inverse prime. Uh, four, which tells us that at inverse has some point for something, but x must have some point for something else. And so we then want to know um, when does uh, four, of course, that's the wrong place. That's good. We want to know when does x equal four? Well, f equals 4 when x is 2. So f inverse prime at 4 could be 1 over x prime of 2. And since we just did 74, that's f prime of 2 is negative 5. So that's going to be negative 1. Is that good? Yeah, thank you. Can you do 73? 73. 73. Talking about an interval from negative 5 to 5. We want to know 
we want to know what is the tangent to x plus cosine x parallel to the secant line. Okay, so this, this is a summing time, right? Summing point. Um, so first off, we've got to know what a secant line is, right? <laughs> you remember what a secant line is? From way, 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 way back, right after we, right after we finished talking about limits, we talked about what a secant line was for like a few minutes. No. no? Okay, secant line is a line through two points of a function. So the secant line for this function on negative five to five is just the line that goes through the point that x equals negative five and at x equals positive five. Um, and then the tangent line obviously is the one where the slope is um, yeah, the tangent line slope by, by taking the direct. So effectively, what we're trying to figure out is when does the slope of the secant line equal the slope of the tangent line? And they give us a calculator. This is in the calculator section, I, I hope, right? It was in the book. Was very yes, correct. I think so. Yeah, calculator or section. 57 and beyond in the calculator section. So we're going to use a calculator for this. Um, now, the way we're going to do it is first we're going to figure out what the slope of the secant line is. So the slope of the secant line should be y evaluated at 5 minus y evaluated at negative 5 over 5 minus negative 5. So what does that equal? Well, that's 5 plus cosine 5 minus negative 5 plus cosine negative 5 over 10. Whatever that happens to be, I have I have no clue. If you have a calculator, you could tell me, somebody could tell me from their calculator what that equals. They don't have to. That's what we can So, we have five plus cosine five minus negative five plus cosine negative five, oh, 10, oh. and then divided by 10. So it looks like that's one. Everyone would agree that that should be one then. Let me just plug that in. So there's y equals one, we'll graph that. So like this. that's one. And we wanna know when is the tangent line slope also one. So what is the tangent line? Its slope is one, not plus, one minus sine x, right? It's the derivative. So when does one minus sine x equal one? Well, that'd be when negative sine x or just sine x doesn't really matter, equals zero. So we're interested on the interval from negative five Five, how many times does sine equal zero? So on your graphing calculator, you graph negative sine x. And uh, if you know, this was me and I was on the AP test and I had my, my graphing calculator, I would change the window on my um, to negative five to five. So you should be able to do that by, yeah. if you look at your graphing calculator and graph your function, it would be a five minus negative five. You can see the exact value of the x min to negative five and the x max to positive five. Uh, on here, I think, I believe I can do it on Desmos also. I believe, yeah, that does it. And so, you, that's exactly what you would see on your graphing calculator. You say, how many times does that equal zero? Well, 
my favorite phrase. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if you were short on time and didn't have time to do all of that, here's what I would do. Does that make sense? And who else? Is? Somebody in Zoom asked that, right? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, okay. Now, if I was short on time, say I'm sitting there doing the calculator multiple choice and I got to like 30 seconds and I got this one question left, what I would do is I would graph x plus x on x on negative five to five. And just in my head, I'd be like, all right, what does the secret line look like? I'd say, okay, it looks like that, right? Between those two points. Well, how many times does it look like the tangent line would be equal to that same slope? Well, one's over here somewhere, one's down here where there's this other little bump, and one's over here where there's this other little bump. Right? It looks like about three times. So if I'm running out of time, I might just graph this and be like, ah, speaking line, okay, it looks like once, twice, three times. And then where it looks like it has that same slope. But you can be sure by finding the derivative, finding that slope, cutting the equal to each other. That, does that help? Does that make sense? Yes. Wonderful. Everyone good, good here with that? Other questions? Anything else from the derivatives multiple choice? All right, that's probably a good time for us to talk about questions from the homework then anyway, since we got about 25 minutes left. Questions from the homework? Sure. Probably, let's, let me, let me look at the I'll pull up the assignment on my phone here. Then I can give you a better answer if that's true or not. Let's see. It was what was it called? Volume by cross section. So I call it right. Yeah. Okay. So the base of the solid is a semicircle of radius three. Okay. And perpendicular to the line. Okay. So it's a semicircle with a radius of three. I don't think I that saying the semicircle would have been centered at the origin of the circle. I just said semicircle radius. Okay. It doesn't matter though because it should be the same. Right? I mean, either way, it should be the same. There's my semicircle of radius three. This is number one. I don't know if you guys could hear Melanie. Melanie. If you guys could hear Melanie, it is the zoom. Okay. So I got number one from the homework. So here's my semicircle of radius three. Um, yes, I took the full circle's equation, which is x squared plus y squared equals nine. Right? And in order to get just the semicircle above, I solve for y, y equals the square root of 9 minus x squared. And it said, yeah, if the positive square root is the part above, the negative square root is the part above. Is that, is that what your question is? Yeah. Yes, that is exactly what I did. So, um, and it's just good to know that if you have a semicircle just laying across the x axis, like flying across the x axis, the equation of that will always be y equals. The square root of a square. Oh, 100% of the time. So that's, that'll make your life easier. Not uh, a square, but whatever the rate is. It's got a raise of one, it'll be y equals square root of one minus x squared. It's got a raise of 10, it'll be 100 minus x squared. Other than that, you're good with number one, though. Other questions from the homework? People here, people in Zoom? Yeah. Can you just like go through number six? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Number six. Amazing. It's still unlocked automatically with my mask on. I was trying to show my wife yesterday my kids' baseball game, and like it wouldn't do. <laughs> Same mask. Yeah. Same mask. Wouldn't do it. And then, like, she'd step away and, like, look away, like, watching the game or something, and then it would work. Right? 
And then, and then I'd be like, I did it again. And I'd mock it and they'd be like, look, watch this. And then she'd look at it and wouldn't do it. Finally got, I finally got to work with one. So that's the All right, number six. Yeah? Yes. Okay. We got one minus x squared is the parabola. So there's your parabola. One minus x squared. And we're talking about enclosed between that and the x-axis. So really, we're just talking about this is the region that we're looking at. And then it says cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are semicircles. So perpendicular to the x-axis, we get semicircles. So that's what the picture should sort of look like. Yeah, ah, that's a problem. Are you good with that now or no? Yeah. Okay. Would you like me to continue with it? Yeah, I think it's okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. So um, these are semicircles. So first off, what's the area of a semicircle? One half. Pi half squared. One half pi squared. Two. The thickness of each of these semicircles is? Dx. So we need to integrate. One half pi r squared dx from so this is the parabola one minus x squared. The intersection points of the x axis are negative one and one. Positive negative one, um, but then we got to write r or r squared in terms of x, and so we would note then that the Diameter here is y, or the diameter is one minus x squared, and so the radius should be half of that. R equals one minus x squared two. So this integral becomes pi over two, the integral from negative one to one of one minus x squared over two. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. And then that's uh, the DX. And then we should be able to distribute out the numerator, apply that square to the denominator also. And then since we have to have it over four, we can pull that over four out here. Make that pi over eight. And then one minus x squared squared would be one minus two x squared plus x to the fourth. Yeah. Then we'll integrate. So we got pi over eight. We have x is the integral of one. We got minus two thirds x cubed is the integral of two x squared. And then we got x to the fifth over five to negative one. Good or no? Yeah. Um, you want me to do the arithmetic or no? Uh, I can do that. Okay. Well, it's just a rough thing. Plug in your one, subtract, plug in your negative one. Okay, yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Everybody else good with that one? Yeah. People at home, are you good with that one? Yep. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Two responses. Twice as many as I've ever gotten all day long. Other questions from the homework? Zoom, questions from the homework? Y'all are ready for your quiz tomorrow? No, but, but you have no questions from the homework. We should just study. Not that you don't understand. Study. I'm hoping not to make the first quiz too difficult. I'd like to start off with a nice, nice solid A after the first quiz. That's the hope. All right. No, nobody has any more questions. Everyone feels okay. Sorry, could you do number four from the homework? Sure. Number four. Let's see what number four is. 
Number four, oh, that's the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, number four had a triangle made from the plane zero, zero, one, zero, and zero, one. And then I said that cross section perpendicular to the y axis, I believe, were equilateral triangles. Is that sound right? Yes, sounds about right. Wonderful. Okay. So, first off, what's the area of an equilateral triangle? S squared. S squared root 3 over 4. In terms of what? In terms of y. So we're going to go from the lowest y value to zero. The highest y value, which is what? Now, then we have to figure out what that side length is. Well, that side length is just however far over we went and the next direction. F is equal to f. So the x up there is okay because the fill of a dy. How am I going to turn the x into y? Well, I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. So I need to get the x out of the y. And it has a y intercept of one. So the equation that line should be y equals negative x plus one. So x ought to be one minus y. So we'll replace the one minus y up there, or the s with a one minus y. And we will get an integral. I'll put the root three over four out in front, because that's the side of that. Zero to one, so one minus y. You want? That's the setup. Good with the setup? Yeah. Okay. And so then we will say root three over four. One minus y squared. I'm just gonna write this is one minus two y plus y squared. Right. So when we integrate that, we'll end up with y minus y squared plus y cubed over three from zero to one. And then it's just arithmetic from there. Root three over four times one minus a half plus a third, and then all the terms are zero when you plug in zero. So let's, let's see, one minus a half plus a third, I think it's five sixths. So. Uh, good or no? Wait, shouldn't the negative 2y become y squared instead of y squared over 2? Yep, it should. Uh, y squared Thank you. Good man? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the homer? People at home, Zoom, questions from the homework? All right. We could just quit now and be done, but what fun is that? We could learn something new. <laughs> Let's do this problem. Much to the chagrin of everybody here, I think they 
they were hopeful that I was going to let them sit here for 14 minutes. The Zoom was like, ah, I can just leave. A couple people already left. All right. Find the volume of a sphere with a radius of four using integration. Now, you probably already know the formula for the radius of a sphere. I hope. What's the formula for the volume of a radius of a sphere, just in general? That is correct. Four thirds pi r cubed. Yeah? We all agree with that? Four thirds pi r cubed. What's the volume of the sphere with a radius of four? What's the volume of the sphere with a radius of four? Yeah, get out the calculator when you're 64 times 4. Yeah. Should be 256 pi by 3. Yeah. Y'all agree with that? Yeah. You forgot the part about using integration. You didn't use integration. We didn't use integration. Why did we use integration? We should have. All right. That's what we said to do. Okay. The answer we get when we do it using integration should be 256 pi by 3. Let's see if it is. How are we going to use some integration to do this? I'm drawing a semicircle here, which is supposed to help. For some reason, that semicircle is going to help us. Hmm. Close. So if we were looking, if we were thinking about semicircles coming out of this, that's not quite going to give us a half of a sphere. But what we're going to do. Um, you, you you sort of got a right idea, but what we're going to do is something even cooler than that. We're going to we're going to take this semicircle, and how can I how can I form a sphere from a semicircle? How do I turn this two dimensional chunk of a circle into a sphere? Yeah. If I take it and I pull it straight out of the board and revolve it around the x-axis. And then go back into the board and keep revolving it around the x axis, go back where I started. Wouldn't that give me a sphere? So I revolve this thing all the way around. I should get a sphere. And the cool thing about a sphere, okay, you remember our lacrosse ball? <coughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not the lacrosse ball. Remember the lacrosse ball? This one's the lacrosse ball. Okay. If we slice it, what do we get? No, I, well, when I open it up, I mean, what do I get? I get cross sections that are circles. And if I were to find each of those cross sections and sum together their volumes, I should get the full volume, shouldn't it? Does that make sense at home? Yes. Wonderful. Makes sense there? Great. So the cross sections are circles. Okay. So what's the formula for the area of a circle? That's the area of a circle. Okay. So all we need to do is take all of the pi r squares from negative four to four in terms of really we could do it in terms of x or in terms of y. We'll do it in terms of x just because that's generally easier. Um, and we're going to sum them all together from negative four to four. All we have to do is we have to write r squared in terms of x. Okay. So how are we going to do that? Well, we started with a semicircle. That's what we revolved, right? So what's the equation of that semicircle? Should know because we just talked about this, right? Equation of a semicircle lying flat across the x-axis is y equals Square root of r squared minus x squared. So y is equal to the square root of 16 minus x squared. Okay. Um, so what is our radius value? Our radius of each of these cross sections is the distance, right? These two cross sections of the circle like this, right? Well, where's the radius of that circle? It comes from the x-axis up to 
the semicircle, which is y. So this is our radius. So all we have to do is square this, which gives us 16 minus x squared. And with any luck, the integral from 16 minus x squared from negative 4 to 4 times pi will come out to be 256 pi over 3. Good or not? Good at home? Yep. Great. Cool. So let's integrate pi. We have 16x minus x cubed over 3. Negative 4 to 4 gives us pi, gives us 64 minus 64 thirds minus negative 64 plus 64. And let's see, 64 plus 64 is 128. We got 128 minus 128 thirds plus 128 minus 128 thirds. It is, that's right. Trust me, it is. It's 256 thirds, and we multiply by the pi, and it comes out to be exactly the same. Isn't that great? Why do we do all of that work? When we could just use the formula. What was the point? For all the other weird shapes, that's right. This one's a nice easy one to just sort of get up the idea. For all the other weird shapes, I should now be able to take any function that I want, and this is what we're going to do tomorrow after the quiz, you can take any function that I want and revolve it around the x-axis, and then I should be able to find the volume of the resulting solve. Because the cross-sections, if I take any function and revolve it around the x-axis, what do the cross-sections become? They'll become a circle, right? It'll be a circle. And I'll just use pi times the radius squared. And what will the radius be? It'll just be whatever weird function I might draw up there, okay? So that's what we're gonna do tomorrow. But before we do that, we'll take the quiz, but before we leave, because we still have six minutes left, let's think about a generic version of this, right? What did we say the semicircle equation was? Somebody, you said it earlier, right? Square root of r squared minus x squared. Where does that semicircle touch the x-axis? Like well, the furthest left and the furthest right points. Negative r and positive r. So if this is y, then the if we took any semicircle, if we you know, think back, just look at it. Right are on y only days for all students. You should not come to school tomorrow. Thank you. We'll see you Monday. Okay. Right. So in a semicircle with a radius of r, it goes from negative r to r. The y value is square root of r squared minus x squared. So we should be able to use this exact same idea that we should be able to integrate from negative r to r of pi times r squared minus x squared dx. This is exactly what we just did, right? We did negative 4 to 4, 4 squared. Well, now we're going to do it generically from negative r to r of r squared for any radius semicircle. Okay? So keeping in mind that r is just a number, right? In our case, it was 4 a minute ago. It could have been a radius of 1. It could be a radius of 100. Right? R is just r. It's just a number. Is our variable. We know it's the variable because the dx. Okay. So when I integrate the integral of r squared with respect to x, and r squared is just a number, should be what? This was 16 before, right? What's the integral of 16? 16x. It should just be r squared x. Is that? And the integral of minus x squared ought to be minus x cubed over 3. And now we're going to evaluate that from negative r to r. So 
and you'll see what happens is when I plug in R, I get R cubed minus R cubed over 3. Then I'm going to subtract negative R cubed plus R cubed over 3. And using a little bit of arithmetic here, R cubed and R cubed is 2 R cubed. And I'm going to subtract 2 thirds R cubed. So 2 R cubed would be 6 R cubed over 3. And then if I subtract 2 R cubed over 3, that's going to leave me with Okay, let's, let's. We're not so good with the arithmetic in our heads, with the fraction, huh? This becomes 2r cubed minus 2r cubed over 3. What did that become? 2 minus 2 thirds. 1 and 1 third, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And that is exactly how you derive the formula for the volume of a sphere. Okay. Isn't that just amazing? Aren't you amazed and astounded? Aren't you amazed and astounded on Zoom? It's amazing. Oh, yes, and astounding. That's right, and astounding. Yeah, yeah exciting. Calculus at work. Oh, yeah, teaching you how to do all the things you learned how to do when you were like seven years old. It's exciting. Okay. That's it, we'll stop there. So, we will have quiz tomorrow, regular time, regular Zoom. Those of you that are here, regular Zoom login as it was before. Um, we'll take the, we'll, you know, I'll answer any quick questions on cross-section volume. Nothing with the circles and the revolution that we just did, um, just the stuff from yesterday. And then we'll continue doing these solids of revolution um, with weird functions. Anybody have any questions in person here? You guys are welcome to wipe down your tables and leave, I guess. And we all can write down um, people in Zoom, if you don't have any questions, you're good to go. If you have questions, you're welcome to stick around.